So good morning. Uh, I start, uh, just started the recording of uh, this class. We, uh, so please, if you don't hear me uh, or you don't see the board, please uh, let me know. We, were, we are talking about solid propellant rocket motors. We already spent a uh, little time on this. And uh, in the last class, we, we focused on one important uh, aspect of these rockets, which is the equilibrium condition that occurs at steady state between the production of mass flow rate generated by the burning of the propellant and the exhaust mass flow rate uh, forced to a limit value by the shocking phenomenon. So because of this balance, we rely the given value of chamber pressure. And we have checked this considering the dependence, the linear dependence of uh, the nozzle mass flow rate on chamber pressure and the power dependence that we have for the burning mass flow rate in the um, in the chamber. So these two has to balance a steady state condition. And we have seen that we have, we have found that the property of the St. Robert law index, let's say the combustion index N, uh, give us information about the possible operating condition in a stable way or in a stable way for uh, our rocket. Because we have seen that if N is greater than one, we will never reach an equilibrium condition because for a small perturbation, we will move away from this equilibrium condition. And so we have seen uh, and discussed this plot with non-dimensional quantities, let's say a dot M prime or a PC prime, which are uh, non-dimensional value with respect to the equilibrium condition which is here. So this is one, one. Uh, this is a straight line. Passing for this point. And we have seen that we can have This behavior, if n is less than one, or this is a power law with n greater than one. This is what we have discussed last time. I would like to uh, go back on a, a dimension, dimensional plot of the same quantities just to, to extend uh, our analysis shortly. Saying that I have, so we assume now that n is less than one. <clears throat> and here you have pc and here dot m. And you see that here, of course, you recall that this is uh, PC AT over C star, and this is rho P AB APC N. So what happens if, uh, for some reason, we have a change of the trot area? If we have an increase of trot area, you see that the slope of this curve with respect to PC will increase. So you see these lines corresponds to increasing AT. And what happens here, you see on this plot, perhaps you see, I don't know if uh, the red color is the best one, at least here where we have some light. And uh, you see that the equilibrium condition changes. 
changes to a lower value of mass flow rate and to an increasing value of the chamber pressure as the trot area increases. So if some, for some reason we have a greater trot area or this trot area is changing, we will have a direct effect on the resulting pressure. Is it clear? And we can see, oh. Oh, let's go to another page. And the same can be seen if we discuss, or something similar can be seen, if you discuss what happens in case of uh, changes of the burning surface. So you see that coefficient multiplying PC is proportional to AB. And so if we now consider uh, an increasing value of AB of the burning surface, we see that in this direction, we are increasing AB. Mm -hmm. So what happens? As you increase your burning surface, you will increase both mass flow rate and, and the chamber pressure. See that the equilibrium condition moves to, towards higher values of pressure and mass flow rate. Another comment that we can do is that when we introduce the combustion index, we, we say that it should be less than 0.8. And we demonstrated here for stability, it should be less than one. And in general, having high uh, values of N will allow to have uh, higher chamber pressures. So in principle, it's not bad, but we, we have to comply with this stability condition. So why we say that N should be less than about 0.8 rather than N less than one, as we have demonstrated by the simple relation. The reason is that when we write dot M T, we see AT over C star, we should consider also that we uh, have a dependency of this C star, of this characteristic velocity on pressure. And you recall by the discussion we have considered about the, the equilibrium condition and of the occurrence, about the occurrence of endothermic reactions, that thus we increase pressure there will be a reduction of the amount of the progress of the, the endothermic reaction. So it means that for increasing pressure, we are going towards having higher overall heat release because of combustion and so higher uh, characteristic velocity. There is a dependence of C star on chamber pressure. So let's assume that this dependence is something. Uh, I don't have a symbol for that, but let's assume that this is star is some way proportional to PC, let's say to alpha. So actually, you see that the dependency of that MT will be of PC. will be about PC to one minus alpha. So when we, we, we consider the uh, DP prime, DT prime, 
that we have seen last time, we will see something like this. And here the condition that will be not for the, 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 the stability will be that n should be less one minus alpha. And so you see that this is something less than one. So what you see, uh, what we have seen, and uh, by this equilibrium condition, after having introduced the burning rate and the burning mass flow rate, you have seen that the burning mass flow rate is related to the available exposed area of propellants which are burning. And so we see here, we have identified that on the equilibrium condition, there is an important role of the Clement factor, which is the ratio between the burning surface and the trot area, the burning area, let's say, and the trot area. Uh, and we also mentioned that this is actually the only parameter that I can control to define a given trust profile. We can design our propellant gray, I mean, our solid propellant, in such a way that we have some law for the evolution of the surface in time that will be uh, translated in a corresponding evolution of chamber pressure in time and in a corresponding evolution of trust in time. So uh, if this is true, it's important to uh, focus our attention on this area. Uh, and this is something that we will do today. We will also mention something more about the uh, evolution. We mentioned also uh, another thing, which is the So we are talking from one side of chamber pressure, and on the other side we are talking about the, um, we mentioned also the erosive burning, and uh, which are two aspects related to the flow, flow dynamics within our combustion chamber, where we, have, we, we are uh, releasing, releasing mass and heat. So we're focused on these two aspects. Uh, actually, we will start with the second one. And I hope also to, to, to be able to talk about geometries. So let's start with this. So often you will see a schematic of this kind, where we have here our propellant grain, which is our solid propellant. Let's consider, and I will mention, we will talk about this shape later, and we will mention here that, for instance, we have some inhibited surfaces where we have no burning of the propellant here. So this is a hollow cylinder which will constitute what we will call uh, tubular grain. Uh, we can identify some something. For instance, that I made a, a bed design here, a bed drawing, sorry. And the reason is that we have to expect that the minimum area is always the trot. So this is not correct. I should consider a narrower trot. Okay. 
because if this is not the case, shocking will occur at the minimum area. And if this is not true, we'll have shocking here at this, this position. So we define, uh, we call this area here the port area. And of course, we consider here the trot area. So you see here that we have a flow which occur along this uh, uh, tubular uh, solid rocket model. And uh, it's interesting to analyze this flow. Actually, we already did, but we'll assume it now, uh, considering for uh, simplicity, the assumption that we have seen when we were talking about one dimensional flows. Let's assume that we are in a condition such that we have one dimensional flow and steady state. You see that here we have addition of burnt gases. And we assume that combustion occurs at the corresponding of surface so that we already reach the final temperature at the end of combustion. So it's like to consider that we are adding gases at the given adiabatic flame temperature Tc. We assume that since then we have constant properties for the combustion product. So we have constant gamma, a given molar mass of combustion products. And let's assume also uh, for uh, this instant of operation that we are considering that the burning rate can be assumed as constant. Finally, if we are considering that this surface is burning in a direction normal to itself, we have that uh, we can assume as first approximation also that you have no component of velocity at the moment of uh, transformation from the propellant, solid propellant to combustion products. We have no component of velocity in the axial direction. So this corresponds to the case we have studied with y that was defined as u i x over u equal to zero. And uh, for this case, we have as governing equations, our dp over p equal to two gamma m squared, one plus delta m squared over m squared minus one. dm over m, you recall this. Well, you know where you can find them. And finally, dt over t equal to two delta times square, one plus gamma, m squared minus one. So an interesting aspect for this kind of flow with mass addition, and this is the case where we have the same enthalpy for the, 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 the additional, <coughs> uh, for the added mass so that we have no contribution in the energy equation. And you have seen that we have here, in this case, some pressure losses, or better, total pressure losses. Similar to what happens with friction of our heat addition. 
And just for the sake of completeness, I would also write that our lambda is one plus gamma m squared d dot m over dot m. So the, the, the difference with respect to what we have seen before is that now we can say something about this uh, d dot m because if we consider, let's say, uh, x direction and we consider an elementary part of our channel here, dx, we can expect that we have here this position some uh, uh, mass release that would be d dot m, and that will be given by the burning rate by uh, multiplied by the density of the propellant and the uh, burning surface. In this case, it will be an elementary burning surface. So you see that here this will be rho p r b d a b. And what will be this area? This area will be given by the uh, circumference multiplied by the elementary length dx. So it will be uh, rho r pi diameter for diameter. by dx. So you see that we have a direct relation between the uh, released mass and the elementary length. And what will be the value at the given position x of the mass flow rate will be given by the integral from this head end up to the position we are considering of the added mass flow rate. So that m be given by the integral from zero to, let's consider that here we have x equal to zero at this position. So we have from zero to x of d dot m or All these quantities can be assumed as constant in our assumption. And so this is trivially rho r phi d x. And so you see that where we have d dot m over dot m, we can translate this directly as d x over x. So this will help us to, to make a correspondence between the mass flow rate and the position we have along the axis of this solid rocket model. So just to evaluate also this quantity here, these pressure losses that are important because this means that we have a higher pressure here compared to what we have as the total pressure in the nozzle. And this can be important because we have to consider that we realize, of course, we have to consider what, to, what are the stresses on the propellant and on the walls defining uh, our uh, vessel, let's say. And uh, of course, the maximum pressure is the, the one that we use to size the structures and the uh, and to evaluate the stresses. So if we have a higher mass, a higher pressure here compared to what we have in the northern, we have to be able to evaluate this uh, uh, maximum pressure. 
Of course, we would like to side. Hopefully, we have maximum pressure always so that we have, we know exactly what we have to, uh, how we have to size the, the, the motor. And uh, if we have changes of pressure, it means that for, and we have a point where we have a maximum pressure that is the sizing one, it means that all along the other times we have something which is oversized that has a higher mass than what can be because of this pressure peak. So we have that uh, not M2, this is from the solutions we, we obtained when talking about the one-dimensional flows, we should have relations like this. You see this also on the table that I distributed in one of the practices. And the press also for the total pressure ratio. One plus delta m two squared, one plus delta m one squared, two gamma over gamma minus one multiplied by one plus gamma m one squared divided by one plus gamma m two squared. So these are the solution for our adiabatic flow uh, because we have just considering the mass addition. So we have total entropy, which is constant and total temperature, which is constant with the mass flow rate value directly related to X. So here we have to, uh, we identify and we name this as the head end. And this position here as the aft end. Of our rocket. So we will use a subscript H here. And the subscript A here. In this case, we have also, we can also identify our length of the propellant grain capital L, and we have that here x is equal to zero, and uh, here we have that this value here will be xA equal to L, and this is xH equal to zero. So if we consider this, and we also consider that here, at this position, exactly at zero, we have no mass flow rate. And of course, we have a world, we have no velocity. So we have Mach number is equal to zero at x equal to zero. And of course, as we have a positive capital lambda, here you see, it means that the flow will remain subsonic by definition of lambda, let's say. Or at most we will reach the condition of Mach number one, but this will not be possible here because of the narrower section uh, downstream, which is the throat area. So using this and also you'll have also ma here we can make a substitution on these expressions and uh, 
Of course, this will be, if you consider generic position, is uh, our position two, and we consider that one is equal to h, and two is the generic one, and we have here that uh, uh, Sorry, and one is the aft end position. We have here that uh, uh, for the from the first equation, we have the generic position. There will be this will be related to the value of x, the ratio between the two mass flow rates, and x is equal to its generic value over. In case one, there will be a value of x a that is equal to L. And then we can write one plus gamma m a squared one plus gamma m squared and then One plus delta m squared, one plus delta m squared to one half m over m a. And you see, of course, that when x equal to zero, we have also have that m is equal to zero. And we can also uh, write the same for the pressure ratio, and we have that. And here it's convenient to, to make the ratio with respect to the total pressure. Let's consider for, for this one, we consider that one is A, and let's consider for this second that our one will be here, the head end. So it means that uh, here we have the pressure P0H, that of course we have Mach number equal to zero, so it means it's also the static pressure and total pressure are the same. So I write P zero, the generic uh, position divided by the value that we have at the end, which is pH. And what you have to do here, where is one, uh, where th there is this Mach one, I have to put zero. So this becomes one and this becomes one, two. And then we have one plus delta, m squared to gamma or gamma minus one. And here we have one plus gamma m squared. And you can see from this relation, you plot this as a function of the Mach number. And you see that we have that P zero. will be less than pH. So the local total pressure will be less than the head end pressure. In particular, this is true uh, at the aft end, where the total pressure will be the total pressure that we have through our nozzle. So what we, is that value, that the value that we call PC. So, uh, if we write this at the aft end, we have PC over PH is 1 plus delta MA squared to gamma over gamma minus 1 divided by 1 plus gamma MA squared. So, you see here this relation where this MA is something that we don't know in principle. And actually, the value of MA, MA depends, of course, on the next evolution. That means from the aft end to the nozzle. And so we know that this MA is related to the contraction ratio that we have from the aft end to the throat. So to the ratio between the 
part and trot area. Considering the, the, the value, the fact that we have one plus plus m squared to gamma over gamma minus one, we recognize that this chamber pressure is also the local pressure multiplied by this quantity that give us the total pressure. So if we consider the pressure that we have uh, here also in general, if we take this expression, we see also that the local static pressure over the head end pressure will be uh, one over one plus gamma m squared. Simple relation that can be also seen as the head end pressure is the local pressure multiplied by one plus gamma m squared. So this uh, help us to, to say that uh, this pr total pressure loss or the difference that we have between the pressure at the aft end, so the total pressure that we have in the nozzle and the pressure that we have at the head end will be greater uh, when the Mach number is higher. This is also written here. In this dp0 over p0, there is a relation which depends on the max number squared. So uh, this is clear and means that the lower the port area, the higher will be this pressure difference. So what are the, <coughs> I, I mentioned something about the, the wall thicknesses or the wall stresses that you have to take into account because of the different pressure. There is also another aspect that we can talk about because we have that here, if we have a difference between the pressure at the head end and the pressure that we have at the aft end, and here locally we have that the burning rate is proportional to the local pressure, of course. So it means that we have a, a different burning rate as we move along this direction. And this can make also the, the, the we can have some unexpected or undesired better uh, uneven uh, evolution of the propellant grain because of this pressure difference. So where do we expect higher burning rate? Of course, where pressure is higher. So here at the head end. And then we, we can expect that we have something like, uh, in case of small port area, We can consider, let's say, an average burning rate, which is this one, and something which is actually decreasing. as the burning rate. This is the average value, and this is the actual value. On the other hand, we have uh, higher velocities as we move forward. So this is partially compensated by the erosive burning, which will increase as we move from the head end towards the aft end. So I think you can agree with this. This is XA. Don't worry about this. So you can imagine that if this is what comes from the uh, Saint Robert law, we have to consider also the role of erosive burning. And as this, this aspect is related to the Mach number, so it means that uh, this effect can be seen when we have high velocities within the, the this uh, uh, the inner part of this grain. So we can expect that also erosive burning 
is important in this case, in the same cases, and this partially compensates this evolution. So this is with erosive burning. And the erosive burning is related to the convective transfer, so to the Reynolds number. The Reynolds number is proportional to the product of rho and V for a given viscosity, for a given diameter. We have just rho V, and rho V is dot M over A, that for a given A is just proportional to dot, dot M, which is increasing as we move forward. So you can expect that the erosive burning is increasing as we move from the head to the aft end. So this is just, uh, uh, let's say, a basic example of problems of internal ballistics that uh, describes the, the evolution of the flow inside uh, solid rock propellant rocket models, model and uh, is a steady state case. Of course, in general, there will be also transient phenomena. And uh, of course, there will be something which is more than 1D. And uh, all these aspects are not treated in this course and will be part of what will be studied in the course of solid propellant rocket models for who of you will select in their uh, study plan. So now what, what we have seen here is uh, related to focus on the aspect that I'm going to summarize. So the, the following uh, is what we have seen, the importance of the Mach number of the F10 which is related to the contraction ratio, so to the ratio between the port area and the trot area. The higher this ratio AP over AT, if this increases, the Mach number MA will decrease. From the basic uh, relation between the area ratio and the Mach number. Then we have seen that the value of the Mach number is increasing along the, the abscissa from zero to this value MA. And uh, of course, this MA also, you can imagine, and we will discuss this in a minute, it's not constant in time, because as the surface change, we can have changes of MA. And in particular, if you consider exactly that cylindrical, that, that tubular grain that you have seen in this example, the lateral surface will increase and the pore diameter will increase. And so as we increase the pore diameter, it means that we are also increasing the port to trot area ratio, and so we are reducing the Mach number and the difference of pressure between the head end and the chamber. But we have to consider that uh, there is an increase of pressure in this case, because we are considering, we are considering a progressive uh, grain. And finally, the, the, the other point that I would like to highlight as one of the results of this analysis is that the maximum pressure occurs at the head of the model. And this can be, in principle, especially if we have a small port area, it can be quite higher than what we have at the nozzle. So the evolution, then we have to consider the evolution of pressure in time, and this will be what we will see in the next hour, talking about the propellant grain geometry. So we can make our break here, and we will resume in 10 minutes at 1.10.
So we are going to talk about uh, the solid propellant grain geometry. And uh, uh, before comment, giving a general comment is that uh, more than once I say that uh, this propellant is regressing in a direction perpendicular to its surface. And here there is an example of a concave and a convex uh, surface, and you see here these lines indicating the progression of the surface at different times. You see the arrows here indicating the burning rate or regression rate of this propellant. And according to Peobert law, Peobert low uh, convex surface will remain convex a concave surface will remain concave I don't remember what what it is so convex surface will remain convex and concave surface will remain concave so this is just to to introduce and to make you have a clearer idea of what we are talking about when we talk about this geometries and their evolution in time. <clears throat> so as I said, the, the propellant grain geometry is important because uh, it goes performance is uh, the only control parameter to get a given trust profile. And also because uh, as we choose the, the, the 
Propellant grain geometry, we also define the size and uh, the volume, let's not the not volume, the, the size and the shape of uh, our model. We, uh, in some sense, we try to make uh, this design, this uh, grain uh, geometry design, the, as efficient as possible. And what is the meaning of being efficient is to realize the desired pressure level and also to exploit at best the, uh, the volume of propellant uh, that, uh, that we have available. So we have a given volume of propellant, that means a given overall total impulse that we can get by this propellant and we have to distribute in some way that allow us to get a high chamber pressure or the desired chamber pressure without considering something which is too big with large empty volumes inside. Of course, the empty volume is an additional volume that means also an additional mass of the external case containing the propellant. So one important parameter is, let's say, that give us something related to the efficiency of the design is the uh, propellant motor mass ratio or propellant mass fraction, which is our lambda here is defined this way. And is the propellant mass over the motor mass. And you realize that here we include, of course, also the propellant in this mass of denominator. So this is a number which is less than one. And this is what we called when we talk about the mass ratios as one minus epsilon as well. This epsilon is the ratio between the uh, inner mass and the sum of the propellant and and uh, mm, inert mass. So it's related to one minus epsilon. And uh, we have values in the range of uh, 82 to 90%. And it can be also higher when we don't need high trust values. So typically to, in case of upper stages, Another aspect related to the propellant grain is that we, it can assume also the um, our segmented shape. So we talk about different segments of solid propellant, and this is related to the stresses that can be, the structural stresses that can be uh, given to the propellant if you consider uh, long, let's say, uh, propellant grains. So, of course, uh, to, to say that uh, the, the shape of the grain, the geometrical uh, definition, the geometrical design of this propellant grain will also influence the kind of uh, mechanical structural stresses that it will uh, have to be withstood by this propellant. For instance, we have uh, local losses if we have some uh, corners and uh, or uh, we can have, as I mentioned, some uh, structural loss, structural loads if we consider long grains. Then, of course, the shape will determine how much will be the pressure difference as we, we, we have seen between the chamber and the head of the motor, we can also, it can also affect the occurrence or not of erosive burning. And it will also determine our uh, propellant geometry design. It will also determine the possible occurrence of what are called slivers. That means the residual propellant that will not be uh, burning during 
operation. So to <coughs> talk about this, we uh, already mentioned the Klemung and its role, and uh, the, also the fact that we uh, may have interest to find some more or less neutral grain. And the reason is that, uh, let's stress once more, is that we can have something like this as the trust profile, or with the same total imports, total imports will be the integral of this curve in time. And it could be also something different, like, uh, let's say, so you see here we have the same area, that means same total imports, but with a different trust profile. And you see that, the, of course, we may need different trust levels, so we may design this in this way. But in general, if you are not interested to have this, you can consider that in this first, in this case with dashed line, you have a maximum pressure which is higher, and so the overall mass, the overall inert mass will be higher. So we, we say that one of the parameters characterizing the uh, propellant grain is the burning surface. Another one will be the fact that the grain is uh, progressive, neutral, or regressive. And uh, we mentioned that this is related to the increase or not, or decrease, the increase or the, 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 the fact that it's constant or the decrease of the surface, that means a corresponding evolution of chamber pressure and trust. Then another parameter which define our propellant grain is the so-called web thickness. The web thickness is the thickness of uh, the grain that will be consumed during uh, is burning. So if we have something like this, we have that this thickness will be exactly this length. Or if we consider something like this, our web thickness will be this one. So of course, it's related to the amount of grain that will be consumed during is burning, and we can define so this W in general, this would be a function of T, and so we can define this web thickness in this way. And the corresponding web fraction is this value compared to the diameter to the radius, sorry, of our case. So we have, we define let's say divided by the case radius. One other important parameter is the volumetric loading fraction. That tell us how much is full of propellant our case. And so we have here the, defined as the ratio between the propellant volume and the overall chamber or uh, case volume or the volume inside the case and uh, this can be in the range between 0.6 and 0.92 then another part that we have seen 
that uh, can be important is the ratio between the port area and the trot area. This is often uh, indicated by the symbol J. And in particular, we consider the initial ratio. So that should be the minimum one as a j i a t this is a t over a p initial one so a p i and then of course also the amount of residual propellant uh, so our slivers and uh, that can be it can be accepted also to consider as much as 5% of residual propellant. And uh, another aspect, the final aspect that I would like to mention is that uh, we may be interested to inhibit some of the surfaces, as you have seen in our tubular grains, Schematic before I mentioned that we can inhibit the ends, for instance, in that case, and this is to better control the evolution of the geometry. So we consider also inhibitors. So let's try to classify our geometries. And we can first uh, uh, say that we have cylindrical grains and three-dimensional grains. We have two, these two uh, big families. Cylindrical grains means that we have one dimension, which is uh, a predominant one, whereas we have no uh, special dimensional predominant in case of uh, three-dimensional grains. Uh, so let's start with, so we have classification. And we have one cylindrical and two is tridimensional, three-dimensional. The most common one is that of cylindrical grain. And uh, among cylindrical one, we can consider the end burning grain, the tubular grain, or let's say in burning grains, tubular grains, and the multi perforated or more complex also uh, geometries. So let's start with the uh, end burning grain, which is the simplest one. Uh, we have this schematic for the end burning grain. It's also called uh, cigarette grain for obvious reasons. And we have that uh, uh, this is the our web thickness. And uh, of course, we have this progressing in the left direction in this schematic 
of the surface is very simple. Is it neutral, progressive, or, or regressive? Of course, this is expected to be. It's too obvious. It's either progressive, neutral, or regressive grain. Regressive, neutral. We have the surface always the same. It's here, or here, or here. A, B doesn't change in time. So this is a neutral grain, which is the good properties in general. We don't expect erosive burning because we have just velocity of the gases are in this direction. There is no convective flow along the surface. And uh, you can also see that we have high volumetric loading fraction because we can feel without holes our propellant within the case. So we expect very high volumetric loading fraction between 90 and 95 percent. And you also, also expect in principle that we have no residuals. Well, in the real world, uh, this is not exactly true. And we can also analyze some possible negative aspect of this grain. Can you imagine something that can be negative? Small burn area, correct. Something, something more that we have not mentioned so far. Le pareti sono protette dal dal grano stesso. Le pareti non sono protette? Nel senso. Cioè il grano, il grano nella forma cilindrica forata funge da, da isolante, nel grano a sigaretta no invece. Corretto. So another aspect is that as the propellant grain regresses, you have that, you see that in this case, after a given amount of time, we are in this condition and you have hot gases here. And so you see that we have that these words are not protected as can be, for instance, in the hollow cylinder that you have seen before, where the propellant grain itself is protecting the words from the hot gases. Uh, so we need, uh, it means that we are considering this kind of propellant grade, we have to consider some important insulation among the worlds. And another aspect that we can mention is that we do have some residuals uh, because either through the case or through the insulation layer, there is some heat conduction. And as here we have hot gases, it means that we can expect that in this region, because of heat conduction, we have a uh, higher temperature because of the contact with the wall uh, of the case or of the protect protective layer, we have higher temperatures. And so what happens is that here is like uh, the case we are changing the value of Ti, of the initial temperature. And so you recall that when the initial temperature propellant, we have a higher regression rate. And so you see that we can have something like, uh, let's say, something like this that show that the surface is being consumed more in the vicinity of the wall, and at the end there will be some residual in the central part 
of the uh, of the model. Consider that, uh, <coughs> of course, when when we talk about insulating layer, we have to uh, understand that it's an additional mass. Always, this is the problem. We can uh, manage it, but we have to consider an additional uh, mass. So this is uh, not used for, uh, especially if you are considering uh, large uh, rockets. So it can be taken into, uh, taken into consideration for just small rockets. So the next, uh, uh, so of course one of the, uh, the, the drawbacks was one was mentioned from one of you i don't know if everybody uh, could hear it so it is the fact that we have a, a small value of a b of the surface area that means that typically we have not uh, this is not done to get high trust because else you should consider something which is very uh, so quite higher uh, cross-sectional area compared to the trot area. And this is something that we told when we introduced the Clemon uh, parameter. So the next one will be the tubular grain. And uh, we have different examples. Uh, actually, uh, this uh, the, the considering a hollow cylinder allow us to have a higher surface uh, available for the burning, and we can consider different cross section of heaven. So we can consider circles or annulus or circular arcs or more complex geometries as the cross section of our hollow cylinder. Uh, with respect to end burning rain, we have a higher burning surface, so it allows to have higher thrust for the same total impulse. And it means that we can get the same total impulse in a short, shorter time with respect to end burning rain. And typically, we have also that the cross-sectional diameter of the case is lower. The, 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 as a drawback, we have a lower uh, volumetric loading fraction. So the simplest case is the of tubular grains. We have the inhibited case. So we have an inhibitor here, and here this is the one we have so we have seen today in the formula analysis. So this is the tubular grain with restricted ends. And this allowed it that the grain is only burning in this direction. The, the a positive aspect is that we are protecting, as you see, compared to the former case, we are protecting these worlds by the presence of the propellant that also works as a, uh, an insulating layer. So we don't need the insulation except that we have, of course, to consider this for, from this point on for the nozzle and so on, and also on the nozzle. And then we have also to consider that as we consume the propellant, something should happen to these inhibitors that it will be an obstacle for the flow. And they will be exposed to hot gases. 
we have also the corresponding case without uh, inhibitors at the ends. And uh, so without restricted ends, we have the same schematic. But in this case, there will be that the surface will progress not only in this direction, but also in this direction. So that we have something like uh, this. as the evolution of the, the geometry in time. <clears throat> and of course, we have to consider here this web fraction, sorry, uh, web thickness, and here is the same. And so we have to properly evaluate the performance of this kind of this geometry, uh, depending on the ratio between this length and this diameter, we can also have uh, reasonably uh, neutral grain. So a grain shows a fair degree of neutrality with respect to the uh, evolution of the surface area. So typically, this kind of, this is a progressive grain. It's clearly progressive. And the reason is that surface is increasing with radius, so it's increasing in time. Here we can also have a neutral behavior because you see that the length is reducing as we also are burning in this direction, in the axial direction. So it's true that we have the, the increase of the surface as the radius increases, but we have also a reduction of the length as we progress with the burning. thickness la, la, la minore nel senso che se fosse per essere minore questo dovrebbe essere come dire così in this case would be the web thickness so the question was what we take as the web thickness the one in the axial direction or in the radial direction of course, the one that will uh, characterize the end of burning. So the, 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 um, the smaller one. And uh, so as far as we consider, this tubular grain typically will be the radial value. Uh, this is uh, inhibited. Uh, a non-inhibited tubular grain and uh, this one, whereas this one seems more like uh, a cigarette grain, an end, uh, an end burning grain with a hole. So it's predominant the, the combustion in the axial direction in the second case compared to the former case where we have a predominant uh, radial direction for the uh, grain regression. Well, uh, a neutral behavior can be obtained if one considers uh, uh, in inhibited cylindrical grain with uh, special geometries inside, special cross sections. And for instance, we have an internal external 
burning, so I just drawing the cross section. where you see already what is the drawback of this kind. of geometry so you see that here the wall is all exposed to hot gases but in principle you could consider or you could imagine that this is progressing in both directions so we have that this central circle is increasing its diameter so we have at the next time something like this whereas we have on this other side a reduction of the surface. So we have an increase in the inner part and a decrease of the area in the external part. And overall, we have something that can balance with each other. And this is the internal external. Burning. Grain. Uh, something similar but to protect the, the the walls so it's the rod and shell geometry and consider that we have just an annulus where we have our gases and we have that this is progressing now in this direction and in this direction so that we have the next instant of time something like this with the internal surface which is decreasing and the external one which is increasing and so again, we can achieve something which is more or less neutral. In both cases, uh, we can have uh, difficulties in uh, as for the support for this grain that will also have to face hot gases. So they are not so practical. And uh, especially at the end of operation, it will be also difficult to be also difficult to keep them. Uh, as a single piece so typically it will be uh, broken in, in pieces at the end of operation so this can be uh, also a possible negative aspect of this kind of uh, grain design uh, then there are also more complex geometries i will show you some image better than trying to uh, make uh, my drawings where we consider also some, uh, uh, let's say, you, you can uh, do something like uh, the uh, not restricted ends also in the circumferential direction. So for instance, you can consider something like this. As the cross section. So we have propellant here, propellant here and here. And you see that we have also this kind of uh, reduction of the overall area because of this tangential burning not only in the right direction but also in the tangential one so it works like the not restricted ends but in this case instead of the in the axial direction we have also a burning in the tangential direction and then we have uh, uh, besides these tubular grains, we have 
more complex geometries like cylindrical grain with uh, uh, star shape and uh, also multi perforated, as I mentioned, and also the three dimensional shapes. Let me try to show you something. That's what I do. <clears throat> so let's try to see something. So this is the rodent shell, rodent tube. It's uh, two ways of calling this. And so you see that we have it results with more or less neutral truss profile. And uh, this is double anchor, not the shape. And you see that uh, this is a regressive grain with a complex geometry evolution, you see here. The, the evolution at different times. And the, in fact, the overall surface available will decrease in time. Prima approssimazione, sì, la pressione non è diversa, quindi gli effetti, non ci sono effetti locali sulla pressione, sono maggiori quelli che abbiamo visto prima per la lunghezza del grano che non quelli che vengono fuori da una geometria, non ci sono, il flusso non è ad elevate velocità, quindi non ci sono forti relazioni di pressione, la burning rate è eh, dovuta, diciamo, essenzialmente all'ambiente, certo c'è un un effetto della temperatura del grano prima della combustione ed è chiaro che quando si assottiglia per esempio qui sicuramente ci sarà un cioè sulla punta ci potrebbe essere qualche accelerazione dovuta anche al preriscaldamento del grano And... questo non è rapidissimo effettivamente Let's see uh, also this case here. This is one interesting and common shape. Now you see this with uh, this squared, uh, let's say this uh, right corners here, but it can be also something which is smoother like this. And these are the star grain, which are common because it's a relatively simple geometry that allow you to have a more or less neutral profile. So this is an important uh, possible option. And uh, this is a multi perforated grain. So you see that here it can be, of course, the, the evolution will be complex. And you see that here, for instance, we, we, we leave something that uh, uh, will easily lead to the existence of the levers. These are different shapes, and you see here the black uh, parts are the slivers related to these geometries at the end of burning. You see in these plots also highlighted the 
the web thickness. And I don't know if I have uh, something on three dimensional grain. Uh, Uh, not here. Well, we'll see uh, probably one of the next times. Yes, yeah, something like this. Uh, this is the, the mandrel. So you see, this is an example of of star grain. Uh, star grain. And uh, the, what also we have to consider is the case of three-dimensional grains. And uh, as we have, we try also to define a trust profile. We are not only interested to the star shape, but also to govern the trust profile. You can consider more complex three-dimensional shape. And one of the, some common uh, geometries are the, the one that is which are called uh, conosyl and phenosyl. That uh, means that we have a cone and a cylinder, or fins and cylinder. So you see that. In this star shape, you have something like fins, and uh, you can combine a region with the star grain, which is also is not uh, inhibited, for instance. So it's also moving the axial direction, and we can consider another part, which is just a cylindrical one. So you can combine different shapes, and uh, these three-dimensional shapes are interesting and have been. Uh, why did you use, for instance, this uh, combination of cylindrical part and some fins in the uh, aft end? So this phenocell geometry is often uh, used for uh, the definition of, uh, for the design of practical solid propellant grains. So I think we can uh, stop here today. Uh, yes, just I had also another, only this, uh, I had also to show the uh, slivers that can be, that can occur in case of star grain. Perhaps it can be seen here. You see, that uh, as we progress, we, we can get a neutral uh, behavior, but at the end we have that some region remains. So our star shape evolution will, will end when, of course, we reach the wall. We have considered our uh, web thickness, and we have this part of propellant left that remain as slivers and this is a small amount of propellant. So we have, uh, of course, a, a breakdown of trust level because the available surface will reduce suddenly as we reach the wall here, as we complete our main part of operation. And we have that this can also burn with the tail of uh, our trust. Uh, that is not uh, completely under control. So this is not a positive aspect of star-shaped grain. So uh, tomorrow we'll talk about uh, the uh, propellant, the solid propellants. Now we see what is here inside this propellant grain that we are talking about, that we have talked about today.